in tech education as well. Uh, and then we have we have some fees and some some tuition. It, it's a minor portion of our revenue for the education fund. It's it's almost entirely state tuition support. Uh, the next primary fund is the debt service fund. Um, debt service is, is a straightforward fund in terms of, of how we use it. It's used to pay long-term obligations for the school corporation. Um, as at, right at the moment, we have um, three outstanding general obligation bonds. Um, we just issued a first mortgage bond, and we have a couple of older ones that, that we're still in the process of paying. Um, we also have common school fund loans, which are used to um, supplement our school technology budget. And then we've got some minor costs. We're, we're able to levy for a portion of um, textbooks that aren't reimbursed by the state for um, free and reduced lunch students, um, some very minor things in the debt service fund. The operations fund is um, really the most diverse of the, the funds. It covers basically everything it takes to run the school corporation outside of what goes into um, the actual in-classroom experience. So uh, we're covering transportation, school buses, fuel and vehicle maintenance, Maintenance and housekeeping, uh, Latchkey, that's our PACE program, is paid out of the operations fund. Um, building and grounds maintenance services, um, so, so we have a, an organization that we contract with to, um, to do a lot of our mowing, that's paid out of operations. Um, the police department, uh, and what was previously the school resource officer agreement with the town, it's paid out of the operations fund. Uh, most folks in the central office are paid out of um, the operations fund. Not everybody, but most folks in central office are capital improvements around the district, so if we take on a capital project, uh, and then some of our technology. So um, some of the, the larger ones we've had recently are improvements to our, our network with the switch project, um, things like that. The operations fund budget, again, is, is a little bit more diverse than the education fund budget. Um, about 45% goes to people, 34% um, wages, 11% benefits. These are almost entirely non-certified staff. 12% uh, of the budget goes to, to utilities. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that we just saw a, a Duke rate increase. Um, so we're expecting that's gonna cost us about $38,000 more an annually. Um, that's paid out of the operations fund. Uh, fuel, uh, buses and capital equipment, and then this 34% is just everything else. There's, there's just a lot of things that, um, you know, random supplies, any capital projects that we decide to take on. Um, equipment that's not capital in nature, all paid out of the operations fund. Uh, the revenue for the operations fund is property taxes, uh, the education fund transfer that we do um, each month. Uh, there's an increment transfer. Um, we're going to cover that a little bit later, but um, increment, as, as the board will recall, is uh, based upon um, refinancing that was permitted in statute about five or six years ago that the school corporation took advantage of that essentially allowed the, the district at the time to transfer a portion of, uh, of proceeds each year from debt service into either capital projects, bus, or transportation. Uh, that's now, now moves into the operations fund. Notably for us, um, that's been close to a million dollars um, in several recent years. It was close to a million dollars in 2019. Moving forward, it's about $50,000 a year. That, that's a significant reduction in revenue. Um, compared to what we've been seeing uh, for the operations fund. And so we've had to um, react to that this year in terms of how we manage our, our operations expenditures. Uh, we have a few fees that go in the operations fund. And um, I didn't list here a local income tax uh, goes into the operations fund. That's a, a small piece of our revenue. Okay, we're going to start going into property taxes. Um, so just at a, a basic level, property taxes, the, the formula for property taxes is the levy that we're going to raise divided by our certified net assessed value um, stated per $100 of assessed value. We're allowed to levy for the operations and debt service funds. We're, we're not allowed to levy for education uh, nor for rainy day. Uh, the levy for the operations fund is capped by a statutory maximum that grows each year by, by a, a percentage that's calculated based on income growth around the state. Uh, the levy for the debt service fund is needs driven based upon upcoming debt service payments in the following year and a small component for the, um, the year after the coming year. And then it's important to keep in mind with property taxes, we won't collect our full levy. Um, we operate in an area that, that experiences circuit breaker loss. And so um, that's a savings for taxpayers and it's a reduction in revenue for uh, for local governments compared to the full levy. So this is what our proposed budget looks like by fund for calendar year 2021. Um, this is what was advertised on the Form 3 uh, two weeks ago um, in Gateway. 
uh, for the education fund, uh, 16.2 million debt service, 7.3 operations, 8.3. Uh, and the rainy day fund, $100,000. Um, you can also see our proposed levy and proposed property tax rate. Um, I wanna make a really important note about the property tax rate, and we're gonna, we're gonna cover that in the next slide. It's common practice among local governments and school corporations to adopt a higher property tax rate than what you anticipate, and the way that you do that is you assume a lower assessed value than what our actual assessed value is. So what we're doing is protecting that fund in case there's um, a late change in our assessed values. And those happen periodically from uh, a property assessment appeal that was missed at the time that the auditor certified assessed values or, or some sort of dispute in what assessed values were. This actually happened in Hendricks County last year um, in Avon and Brownsburg. It didn't impact us. But, so we'll ask, the school, we'll ask the board to adopt a slightly higher operations fund rate than what we know we're gonna actually be certified for. Uh, the debt service fund, on the other hand, uh, we've, been, we've been pretty public uh, in, in saying we're gonna keep that at the uh, cap to 89 cents, um, which is what the, the rate was last year. Uh, and so that's, that's what we advertised. Uh, and going to the next slide, I actually went ahead and show what, what we're anticipating the actual rates to be. So uh, the debt service rate for 2020 um, was, was 89 cents. We, we advertised the 89 cent rate again. Uh, we're actually anticipating that we're going to see a reduction in our debt service rate. So that's, a, again, a savings for, um, for taxpayers that fall below the tax caps. Uh, that occurred for a couple reasons. The first is uh, we did really well on our first mortgage bond issuance. The, the interest costs on that were, were very low. We're in a low interest rate environment right now, and that worked to our advantage. And then our assessed values went up more than they have um, in the last couple of years. So those factors combined are going to drive down our debt service rate a little bit. So it's a... Um, savings for taxpayers. Uh, in the same way, the operations fund, while we're gonna ask the board to adopt that higher rate, in actuality, we're expecting a slightly lower certified rate um, for the operations fund this year. Any questions? That, I know that's kind of moving quickly through technical technical matter there. Uh, I want to take a look at the budget for 2021 compared to prior years as well. Uh, and, and again, I want to focus in particular on um, the operations fund, but we'll cover education um, education first. So you can see in education, we spent $14.3 million in 2019. We're, we're looking to, to be close to $14.9 million in 2020 out of a $15.4 million budget. Uh, we're going to ask the board to approve a $16.2 million budget with, with every expectation that we'll spend. Uh, five or six hundred thousand dollars less than that um, in 2021. Uh, the debt, the debt service fund is, is um, we're going to the certified budget is going to be a little bit lower than what we proposed. Again, just based upon um, some savings through through what our actual first mortgage bond sale amount was. The operations fund is the one that I really want to spend a little bit of time looking at together. Um, in 2019, we spent 7.4 million dollars. We're on track this year to spend about 6.6 .6 million dollars. Uh, we've, we've done that through, through two primary methods. Um, we saw some savings with school closure. Uh, electric bills were lower. We weren't driving school buses. That, that saved us a little over $100,000. The biggest component in our savings is um, we've not spent much on capital, uh, capital needs this year. And that, that was intentional as we adjusted to that lower increment amount. Uh, that's, not, that's not something we can maintain forever. Uh, you know, we're going to have to address some capital needs at some point, but, but for this year at least, we're gonna see pretty steady um, beginning and ending cash balance in the operations fund uh, because we intentionally drove our, our expenditures down. We're asking the school board to, uh, to approve an $8.3 million budget, but, but again, we're doing this with an understanding that we won't spend close to $8.3 million next year. Uh, that gives us the leeway, and, and we'd, we'd collaborate with the board if we had to do it. That gives us the leeway to spend if we have capital needs that come up in a hurry that we just we need to put some money into. Uh, but that would be, again, in, in collaboration with the, with the school board. Uh, we also asked for an appropriation of $100,000 in the rainy day, hoping not to tap into that. We, we haven't this year. We're not anticipating spending rainy day this year, but we're going to ask for $100,000 of appropriation um, just in case. This is the, the timeline for um, the budget process. We, we advertised this at the, the June school board meeting uh, and covered it there. Uh, so, so I'll move... I'll basically just jump down through. Um, so we advertised the budget on September 9th. 
Uh, tonight's meeting is the, the public hearing on the budget. Um, there's no action from the school board other than, than taking input from uh, members of the public that would, would like to provide it. At the October 5th school board meeting, uh, we're gonna ask the board to, to adopt the budget, capital project plan, and bus replacement plans. The statutory deadline is, is November 1st, so that's our, uh, October 5th, our last regularly scheduled school board meeting at which we could do that. Between November and January, we're not sure when, we'll receive what's called the 1782 notice from the Department of Local Government Finance. That's a preliminary budget order, uh, and Dr. Schaefer and I will receive that and, um, and, and make any changes required. They're, they're usually technical changes, nothing too big, um, especially given the, the budget and levy that we're going to adopt this year. Um, my expectation is that on the Education and Operations Fund, DLGF will probably certify the budget that we adopt. Operations Fund, they'll certify the levy that we adopt. So I don't think we're gonna see significant changes during the 1782 window. And then we should have a certified budget by January 15th, hopefully realistically by the end of this calendar year. Uh, we have uh, five resolutions that um, the school board is gonna be asked to consider at the October 5th school board meeting. So I'm gonna jump from the PowerPoint that we're looking at now over to, to um, PDFs. Uh, but the three, that, the three that are budget related, all right, they're, they're Paper copies I, I gave to you before we started. Mr. Parkinson, would you would you think is this a good time to ask for any questions on this um, document, or would you rather get through this and, and do all this at the same time? We we can do either way you like. Do you have any questions right now, or you want to hold them till later? I don't have any questions. I've got a, a handful, but I'll wait until later. Okay. okay. All right, thanks. Okay. okay. Uh, so the, the first three resolutions are all directly related to the budgeting process. The last two are indirectly related to it, but they're going to occur at the same meeting. Um, the Line 5 resolution was formerly known as the Line 2 resolution. Uh, what that, and I'll jump over and look at it in just a moment. That, that's basically the board giving Dr. Schaefer and me authorization to reduce the current year budget, um, which is going to let DLGF see what our actual cash balance is at the end of the year. Uh, the increment transfer resolution allows us to transfer that roughly $50,000 from debt service to the operations fund. And form four is the actual resolution um, for appropriations and tax rates. So uh, I have on the, on the screen now the line five resolution. Again, I, I won't read it line by line, but essentially what it says is that we're not going to spend our full budget and the school board is delegating authority to Dr. Schaefer and me to communicate to DLGF that we anticipate spending less than our full budget, which then frees up those dollars as starting cash balance to help fund the budget in 2021. The second resolution is the increment transfer resolution. Uh, and that is our way of um, letting the Department of Local Government Finance know that we still intend to take advantage of that debt refinancing from again, five or six years ago, um, that allows us to move a small portion of our debt service levy into the operations fund. Again, about, about $50,000. And then finally, the third, as it relates to the budget process, is what's known as the Ordinance or Resolution for Appropriation and Tax Rates, or the Form 4. Uh, what we have displayed in your packet, this is the 2020 Form 4. This is what we asked the board to adopt last year. Uh, what you'll see in the budget levy and tax rate columns um, at the October 5th meeting is the figures that we covered um, earlier, un unless the board asks us to, to do something different in advance. Uh, so it'll have the funds, it'll have the budgets, levies, and tax rates down at the bottom. It'll have the name of each of the, names of each of the school board members um, and, and the, the direction in which those board members vote. So my plan from here is to trans transition into the capital projects and bus replacement portions of the meeting. And I thought if it works for the board and if it works for our folks in attendance, we take input on all of it kind of kind of at once. Yeah, that's, that's fine for me as long as it's okay with you guys. Is that yeah. okay with you, Dr. Beatty? He's sleeping. <laughs> Dr. Beatty, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, Matt, speaking on the microphone, or I can't hear you. That, that's okay. Sorry about that. Um, do you want to? Are you okay with waiting until the end of Mr. Parkinson's presentation for questions? 
Yeah, he can go ahead. All right, thank you. So, would you like me to go ahead and go into capital projects and budget replacement before we take the board questions, or do you want to talk about the budget now? Uh, well, I would rather probably talk about the budget right now right. and just break these up. So, uh, I think that's easier that way. We don't we can just talk about those other two, and those other two discussions will not be as long, um, perhaps. Um, all right, so if the board has any questions regarding Mr. Parkinson's presentation and or um, the resolutions presented, um, now's the time to start uh, discussing those. You said you had some questions. I do, I do. If I'm you want to go ahead notes. and start then. Certainly. Um, first of all, um, just uh, some of these are clarifying uh, discussion points, so it might not be, uh, you might just be like, yes, you understood that, or no, you are so wrong. <laughs> um, but looking at the education fund um, and the, the budget difference, just a second. Give me a second. Okay, so what I was seeing is about a 5% increase in the education fund proposed budget from fifteen million four hundred two thousand to uh, and some and some dollars to sixteen point two four two, right? right? Okay, but um, so watching that, that's about eight hundred forty thousand dollar difference. But when we look at the debt services, I'm noticing there's about a four hundred thousand dollar decrease in our budget due to debt coming off, even with the new debt we've uh, incur incurred. And then I'm also seeing, in the, from the operations standpoint, um, the operations budget proposal is also decreasing by a smaller amount, but about $150,000. So the total increase we're looking at is somewhere in the ballpark of 250000 ish to $300,000. Okay. Rainy day remaining the same. Correct. That's a good summary. Yep. Okay. All right. And and then the just to go over this one more time, just so I make sure I have this correct. And we've done this every single year. But bottom line is we want to approve a rate based on um, the new assessed value that um, is a bit higher than our budget, just in case there are. Uh, challenges to assessed values and our total assessed value for the community were to drop. Right. Um, and that would be really, is that the only situation that would um, require us to do that? What can you think of another situation that would? No, that's, that's really it. If our assessed values for one reason or another went down compared to what the auditor certified, and it, it's unlikely. I mean, the yeah. most likely case is that the, the values certified will remain our values. It, it'd have to be a large number of residents a, applying for right. um, an appeal, appealing their evalu evaluation assessment and or a really large, like Walmart or something that's, like that. That's exactly right. Win, yeah. Winning an appeal. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, and are there any changes in the in the recent changes at DLGF, uh, not in personnel but in policy, um, that would require us to to make any considerations based on their review of our budget process? Have there been any changes there that we need to be aware of? Not not ones that are significant uh, compared to last year, at least. But probably the. I guess probably one thing that is worth mentioning, this has been the policy for a couple of years, is if we adopt a budget in the education fund and the operations fund, and rainy day for that matter, that is fundable based upon our cash and our revenues, and for the operations fund is at or below our maximum levy, they will give us the budget that we've adopted. It, it gives more autonomy to local governments and school corporations than was the case as recently as, as three or four years ago. So we're intentionally adopting fundable budgets and at or below we're at our maximum levy uh, if you look around at other school corporations even within our county not everybody is kind of caught up to to that method so you're going to see some school corporations that are proposing 50 percent levy increases um, that, that's kind of a an old mindset that that dlgf is going to to cut you um, and, and statutorily they can't and they won't if if you're at or below your maximum levy okay all right that's helpful um, other questions I look through my notes. Dr. Bay, do you have any questions at this time? I do, I do not. Okay. I, Mr. Mason? Thank you. Um, on our rainy day fund, we're taking 100, you're wanting 100,000 out of that to 
explain that to me. I'm struggling with that for some reason. Sure, sure. So it really that's that's a, f a fail safe. Um, it's that would be a last resort if if we get into dire straits um, and we can't fund an expenditure out of education or operations. Rainy days, where we would go. Um, it's it's my belief, and I think it's probably this board's policy too that that we tap into rainy day infrequently. We we try to not do that, um, and we haven't so far in 2020. But really, we're just kind of asking for your authority in case we really get into an emergency situation. Our balance in our rainy day right now is six ninety one seven forty five. Uh, it it is without factoring in the the CD. So we have one point five million dollars from the rainy day that's invested in the CD. So it's really close to about two point two million dollars okay. in the rainy day fund. Okay. And as we've discussed before, the CD is very liquid. The CD is very liquid. The, the six ninety one is cash on hand, but right. the CD is right. very liquid. It, it was, if I remember right, it was, I think, 30 days. It, once you got past the 30-day period, you, you could withdraw it. You wouldn't get the interest for the rest of the year, but you could withdraw it without penalty. So okay. it's very liquid. Yeah. And, and Mr. Mason, I think from our, and this might even be years prior, you know, there's been a goal as to a percentage in that rainy day fund of about 10 to 11 percent, but we're below that or closer to, what, about 7 percent? We can just do an estimate, I guess. Yeah, of our, of our total 5. expenditures. Yeah, we're actually, yeah, about 8%. Yeah, out of, yeah. yeah. So we're maybe, I don't know if we're, I wouldn't say low there. I mean, you'd like to have, back in the day, I guess, they used to get up to like 30% of their budgets, you know, uh, in rainy day funds. But the problem with that is you're taxing the public and taking in revenue. Yeah. So it's money out of their pocket that you're yeah. just putting in an account. So the thought process is to have it a lot closer to our budget, but yet at the same time have some sort of cushion. Sure. So I think that's how we've gotten there over the years. I guess my point of asking that is just to show our constituents that we're being frugal with their money, that there is a little back. In at the case same time, of, not over but we're not taxing having and putting a lot big in there. Savings plan there that we're overtaxing them while we've got a large abundant a mass of money back yeah. there and yeah. and that we um we're not dipping into rainy day just yeah. all the time yep very good and if, if i might add the that appropriation a relatively small one a hundred thousand dollars is is just in case there's some unforeseen reason we would need it without having to do an emergency additional appropriation at yeah. that time which is kind of cumbersome so we just have approval again given an emergency situation we'd be able to tap into a hundred thousand of it which is a very small percentage of what is actually in the rainy day fund. Correct. That's correct. Thank you. Um, I guess one more last qu clarifying question. I think I'm done with my questions on looking at the proposal. Um, but just so I understand, so the 2021 proposed rate of 89 cents is the exact same uh, proposed rate for 2020. Yet our anticipated certified rate will actually be 8.85 uh, cents to 0.88 cents on the $100 valuation. That's correct. Okay. Um, can you just, for for um, the recording and for the public record, share at least your professional um, uh, experience as to how that rate stacks up to other rates in the state? Sure. Uh, well, probably the, probably the most direct comparisons to the Hendricks County School Districts. We're, we're either third or fourth. It goes back and forth mm -hmm. on our debt service rate. Uh, in our tax rate compared to the other Hendricks County school districts, so we're, we're right in the middle. Um, there are, there are, um, in transparency, there are school districts around the state that have a lower debt service tax rate than we do. Quite a few of them. Um, the Hendricks County school districts and a lot of the Donut County school districts do have, uh, you know, we fund part of our operations and a lot of our construction through through debt service. Well, you also have to keep into account, take into account your assessed value, right? Mm. A certain cost of just doing business, whether you're doing a massive capital project or not. Um, but, you know, you still have to have school buildings. Yep. And so if you're a smaller community with a smaller assessed value, your rate's going to be higher than if you're a really large um, community with a higher, or not even a large community, but a community with a much higher assessed value. Yeah, that's okay. true. All right. That's true. Okay, any other questions? I just, one more thing to point out, if I may. The the transfer that we do, I know that's been asked before of why we transfer that money. The the charge that you have, I think, depicts very clearly of why exactly we do that, that transfer 
when you start looking at our budget and what we have um, in our operations fund, which, uh, you know, a lot of our payments, a lot of our debt comes out of that to pay for a lot of our day-to-day -day expenses, right? Right, yeah. It, it, there's, yeah, it, it covers an awful lot of the school district. Um, and, and again, I guess many of these were paid for out of the general fund um, as recently as 2018. Uh, and then was shifted, they were shifted to the operations fund, uh, but, but the revenue for the operations fund is, is the same as the former capital projects, bus replacement and transportation funds. Um, so what we're doing is transferring a portion of the education fund revenue to help fund a lot of those things that we require just to keep, I mean, in a literal sense, to keep the lights on um, or, or to pay for things that, that previously would have been general fund expenditures. And, and reason being because the education fund is... Uh, Corey, can you speak up? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, Doc. Uh, and that's because, you know, we're budgeting for 2021, what, 16000 in our education fund and only 8000 uh, in our operations fund is the way that the state has financial funding. Right. right? That's correct. Per, per, the, per the state government's funding formula. Right. That's that's consistent with what a lot of other school districts look like, too. Yeah. And I suppose I, I didn't mention this when I was when we were covering this before, but I, but I probably should. If we sort of think about this pie chart, everything from that from the top going clockwise over through buses, at least going over through fuel, I think we can pretty reliably say we're going to spend that money or something that's like that money this coming year. Um, we're probably going to spend a little bit less on on buses and capital equipment than what's budgeted here. And then this other 34 percent significantly less. Um, than what we've actually budgeted. So again, that's getting back to, we're probably gonna spend somewhere closer to $7 million or, or maybe a little over $7 million. And that reduction compared to the budget we're gonna ask you to adopt is mostly made up out of this green piece here. This is what would be capital expenditures. Right, Corey. And I do correct myself. I think I was saying 16,008 and I need to change that to million. Right. <laughs> My eyes are Just cross -eyed. Let's move, move a decimal point. Yeah. 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 I, I wanted to uh, elaborate a little bit too on, on your question in terms of that transfer. This is something I think most people aren't aware of. Our, our costs that we used to cover out of the general fund uh, represented, a, I believe at that time, about 19 and a half percent. We're only transferring transferring 15 uh, maximum 15 percent so we have in effect in terms of that that those pool of dollars and that pool of obligations that go with that we've already reduced ourselves by 23 percent yeah great point by yeah. reducing ourselves from about 19 and a half percent of those expenditures down to 15 percent of what is now transferred so and we've done that intentionally we've we've cut cut spending and, and cut costs there and try to cover with what we can to retain as much as we can back in the education fund a good point thank you mm -hmm. Thank you. I do have a few more questions. Sorry, I missed a whole page of questions. Um, obviously, getting to that, I mean, as we're putting together this budget, you know, it, we're budgeting, so we're not going over line items of everything that we've spent in the past and whether we're going to spend that exact same dollar amount moving forward. I know that that's what we asked you all to do to come up with these more of macro numbers. But I do have a few questions or just want some assurances. Our, and this isn't a, a line item on our budget. This is just a descriptor that you gave on the operations fund budget uh, slide. But for example, like latch key wages and benefits. I, I just want to, you know, get an idea. And we've been watching this from a month to month standpoint. But, you know, those are those should be revenue neutral, right? Because we're actually bringing in um, fees for those. But yet at the same time, maybe pace on, the, uh, on another hand might not be compared to something else, like for example, um, um, our, uh, our preschool. So any thoughts about that? Well, uh, I wanna make sure I understand the question. Uh, what we're wanting to cover is basically PACE or Latchkey as a, as a component of the operations yeah. fund and, and essentially kind of how it's, how it's funded, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we, we pay for, for Latchkey or PACE out of the, the operations fund. Um, it is, it is self-funded by, um, by fees paid by families. Uh, the, the, um, yeah, I don't know that I can rattle the exact dollar amounts offhand, but, but the, the budget for, for PACE is gonna be probably a little under $200,000. Uh, 
uh, for 2021, and we're going to anticipate taking in somewhere in the neighborhood of 240 or $250,000 in revenue. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that we have talked about in the past, just in, in fairness to that program, is, is that there are some indirect costs that are associated with it. I mean, it, it does contribute to, um, to utilities uh, and, and, you know, general wear and tear in the building. I think that the revenue uh, more than offsets what those incremental costs would be, but that would also be in the operations fund. I guess that's the point I'm trying to get to, right, is when we look at budget cuts and um, depending on the makeup of the, the board moving forward, so we have three board members you know, moving on, um, we want to make sure that what we're proposing is something that covers what we have, right? And, but at the same time, I'm trying to under, make sure that I'm understanding the fact that uh, some of these uh, some of these items that are in the budget are also taking in revenues right. to, to pay for that, but not all of them are 100% self-sustaining. But the goal was, especially for um, the the preschool, to, to get to that point. But yet we have a half of a, for example, we have uh, some education fund expenditures mm -hmm. there with a half of a, an administrator and a, uh, for the uh, for North Elementary and the other half for. Uh, the, the preschool. So looking forward, as we look at how we spend these dollars in 2020 and 2021, those are the areas I think we'd continue to look at to see if rates need to, fees need to be raised yep. or changes need to be made in those kind of areas. Yeah, I agree with you. I do it's, it's important too to understand, I, I know we're talking about that, but we talk about spending out of the operations fund for those things, but as you're talking about, it's important that our public understands those fees that parents pay, for example, those revenues are going into the operations yeah, fund. exactly. And then we pay it back out of the operations fund and both the, uh, our preschool, which is in the education fund, Yep. And uh, PACE, which is uh, operations, and both of those are revenue positive. Yeah, okay, yeah, very good. Um, okay, so so basically, like you said, I mean, we're looking at about 34% of that operations fund is really where I see where the, the greatest debate can be with regards to how we spend money in 2020, 2021. Um, this budget basically has us sitting just as a small in an increase from 2019 to 2020, but I'm just, uh, um, in, I guess, asking and, and, and uh, that the administration continue, uh, if we were to pass this budget, continue to look at those expenditures. I uh, wouldn't think that we'd do anything differently um, to um, save as much money in those areas as possible, especially that area that we've said is, look, a number of things. I mean, I know for the sake of a pie chart, we'd have like 800 little slices yeah. here if you right. were to slice it up too much. But I think really that's where the, the one of the few areas where you can make any cuts is probably in that, that area. Yeah, I, no, I agree with you. And, and Unless there, you're just going to cut people and their wages and their benefits. I mean, well, yeah. Well, and I should say, too, that we, we have, uh, you know, through attrition, we have reduced our headcount intentionally yeah. um, on the operational side in particular. Uh, as Basically, as each position comes open, we're taking a hard look at it. Um, and so we, we are down on purpose, uh, folks in central office, housekeeping, housekeeping. Uh, Technology, which is paid out of the education fund, uh, and, and again, we we do those carefully, but but deliberately each time a position comes open to try to make sure that that we uh, maximize the dollars that we can put toward you know the most productive uses. Well, the office you gentlemen work in are a good example of that. Less people working there now than right. a few years ago. Right. So okay. Well, I think that's important to note too is that we're not laying people off. We're not riffing teachers any cuts we've had in staffing has been through attrition when somebody's left right. and we just haven't filled the position. Right. Yeah, when you, can, when you can address and put together a budget like this that keeps the tax rate the same but still isn't laying off a lot of the employees that are contributing to the learning environment, we're in yeah. a really good position. I would argue that if, if, if Mr. Parkinson and Dr. Schaefer brought to us a, a budget that would have increased um, the tax rate a small amount, but it was in an effort to greatly um, keep the number of uh, faculty and staff needed to continue the same education level, I'd be in favor of that as well. But in this situation, we're, yeah, we're able to do that and 
have an actualization of a lower rate than what we're even advertising. So I think it's a great position to be in, uh, especially in light of this year being as crazy as it is. Um, one, uh, I keep saying one last, I'm going to not say that anymore. Um, with regards to e-learning and the, the added unique expenses that we've had, can you tell me what kind of thought process has go, gone into going, boy, are we going to, in 2020, 2021, continue to have this, you know, we could potentially have this dual method of educating still, which at the high school is a little bit more expensive per student, and or we're only five weeks into school. Dr. Schaefer, you might be coming back to us in a week or two after kind of a first quarter evaluation and saying, yeah, look, we need more um, human resources in order to keep pulling this off. I know many corporations are running into that. Can you uh, share with us kind of your thoughts in that area that led to this, these numbers? Uh, I will start anyway, and, and Matt, please, please jump in. Uh, I can tell you right now, we're doing a, a survey of our families who are taking part in online only learning, just to see what their, their requests are. I think early results would tell us we probably have more people requesting to come back in than to stay uh, online. Uh, but I'd also tell you in several conversations with many area districts in the last two weeks, uh, what we're offering right now, I think we're in a good position. Um, we've offered that choice, a limited choice between those two programs. We have not went to alternative schedules. Um, we're finding that districts that offered a multitude of choices or that went to alternative schedules are really struggling academically right now and support-wise for their teachers and their students. And it's difficult uh, if for our teachers. And there's a lot there. There's a lot to do right now in the current context. But I think we're in much better shape than, than, than many districts right now in that regard. So, you know, we'll see how things uh, move forward in the future with COVID. We will continue to assess um, the wants and needs of our, our public and, and of our teachers and teaching staff as well. Um, but right now, um, I, I feel like we're in a, in a decent position that's likely to get bad, better rather than worse, I think, in, in, the, in the near term. I think uh, next spring will we'll tell us much more. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on it, but uh, as uh, Mr. Parkinson already pointed out, we've positioned ourselves intentionally in this budget and with attrition reductions, because we know it's, it's likely to be a tough biennial budget that comes out of the legislature this year for, for public schools. So we've positioned ourselves to prepare for that, uh, much like uh, in my past what I did in 2010 coming out of the, re the, the, the Great Recession. So we're, we're looking down the road at that. Uh, across the board, we've made attrition cuts in, in I think, every departmental area except for maintenance. Uh, we've made cuts ahead of time uh, to try to make sure that we meet our budget but also meet our needs educationally. All right. Um, are there any other questions from the board at this time? All right. Hearing none, let's. Mrs. Smith, what would you like us to do um, from a technological standpoint? I just did that. I'm doing that right now. Okay. Okay. Mr. Parkinson. Okay. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna move to the capital projects portion of the discussion. These two pieces are gonna go, I think, quite a bit quicker um, than than the overall budget um, because this largely feeds into what we've already discussed. So we are required by by state law to adopt a capital projects plan. If we anticipate spending uh, out of the operations fund on anything that exceeds $10,000 for an asset or a project that's capital in nature. And again, the, the key component here is out of the operations fund. So um, we have the North Elementary project, which, which we're funding within that, that debt service tax rate that we discussed before. Uh, those items don't have to be on the capital projects plan. Uh, if, if we have things that are in, that we're gonna pay for out of other construction fund proceeds, those don't have to be included either, but this is really operations fund items. So I'm gonna switch over to the capital projects plan, which was posted online, the same time that we advertised the budget hearing. And um, I suppose what's key to note here is there, there is more listed here than we can realistically take on. We, we, just, we can't do all these things, uh, but, but we're going to put them out there as, as our potential items um, and then monitor what the needs are as we get into 2021. So the first page of the capital projects plan is the actual resolution that we will ask the board to adopt on October 5th. The second page of the uh, capital projects plan, these are the, uh, the, the assets that we anticipate 
potentially having to pay for over the next three years. Um, our maintenance vehicles are um, in dire need of upgrade. Um, we also have, uh, we have several boilers. It's, it's the same model of boiler in, in all three buildings that the school corporation invested in uh, 10 or 11 years ago. And, and um, I wish I could get into the technical details. This isn't, you know, that, that's not necessarily my, my area of strength. Um, but it's, it's a high efficiency type of boiler. And what we're finding is that the way that it handles um, water, it, it, it's more prone to leaking. Um, than, than a conventional boiler. So we've, we've, got, we've had several meetings recently with, with vendors. We have another one tomorrow um, trying to explore what we can do to, to, to keep these things up and running without having to take on significant cost of replacing them. But um, I think it is realistic to think we're going to be replacing somewhere between one and three boilers um, in the next two or three years. And then the, the, the third page is uh, capital projects. Our projects that are capital in nature. Um, there, there's a mix here of, of things that are um, infrastructure on, on the buildings and, and then things on the, the grounds themselves. Uh, we have uh, seal coating work that, that we're going to be, uh, it's going to be coming due. You usually like to do that within two years after you, after you pave, and that's to try to maintain the life of, uh, of those parking lots for as long as possible. Um, at the high school, we have, we have some areas around um, the library and the auxiliary gym and the auditorium that um, we, we've been seeing some water coming through. We received an initial quote. It's, it's pricey, unfortunately, to repair that roof area, but um, we need to, to plan ahead in case that, that happens to, um, to worsen. Um, some roof drain work that's been um, you know, proposed for the middle school for a number of years we've not had to take on yet. Uh, the next area that, that is going to be due for paving is the middle school parking lot. Uh, that was the one that was, was done longest ago, and so we, we need to be um, mentally planning ahead for, for that one. And that's one that, that I do think that we'd, um, if, if we find ourselves in a position to do it next summer, I think that we would, um, you know, we'd ask the board's consideration for that particular project. Uh, and then one that, that we are almost certainly going to take on is, is the wireless access point refresh. We're, we're due for that one. We have, we have to do it. Um, it, those, uh, it was a five-year project at the time we took it on. Um, that is going to be paid for using E-rate funds, which means that we'll receive half the money back um, that we invest into that project. I'm happy to take any questions from the board about capital projects plan. Go ahead. So uh, back to the boilers. Um, you know, they have three years there, 21, 22, well, I guess 21 and 22. So <clears throat> we're not saying those are automatically going to be replaced. Right. We're going to continue to try to work with them, patch them, whatever term you want to use. We are. The, and, and we may have to, the 40,000 may get spent on a new boiler or it may not. The, the South Elementary boiler is the one that's, that's you know, that's the one that's most pressing. Uh, we, we're probably going to take on the south the south boiler just out of, out of necessity. Uh, that, that's there's a good chance that's going to be this fall um, as we we head into the cooler season. Um, north in the high school, uh, you know, our, I think our maintenance team thinks we have a shot at, at keeping those going for a while. Uh, they they do preventative maintenance, and we bring in um, outside vendors to help us with some of the things that we don't do ourselves. And you know, hopefully we're gonna we're gonna be able to kind of keep working with those. But if I might add, those those three boilers are all by the same maker. Um, they're all midlife. We should be able to get another 10 years out of them. Uh, but what we found is with this particular style of boiler, um, even compared to other boilers that that same maker has made, uh, they're not holding up. Uh, we, we know we're going to have to replace the one at South. Uh, the other two are in a little better condition for whatever reason. They seem to be holding up a bit better but still having some issues. So we're hoping to make some repairs to those and, and get that other 10 years out of them, but it, that's a bit unknown right now. Okay. Thank you. One of the things that one of the things that I see that's missing, but it's maybe because we're re re reacting to um, failures of this unit, but like with the, the school pool, for example. You know, obviously, that's not on here, but it's not uncommon for us to be told, "Hey, look." We got five thousand dollars here, ten thousand dollars here. For um, is it just because we don't have a plan for? Um, we just don't know what's going to break, so, so we don't really have a. So way to 
Yeah, that's a fair question. The, the, there, there would be no, there'd be no realistic way to pay for a, a new pool. Sure, I get with, that. With, with yeah. these funds. Um, there, there is ongoing maintenance. Uh, we have one, one expenditure that's out there that we could find ourselves taking on. That's um, the air handler in the, in the pool area is, yep. is problematic. And it's been problematic for a long time. Um, we continue to patch that. If, if we ever replace it, that, that's about a $200,000 project. Um, so that, you know, so that, we, that would be a big investment. It, so and this is maybe a, it's a question for both of you and I guess for the board as well, you know, as we move forward and figure out how best to handle that. Um, is that one of those situations where the reason that's not on here is because of a greater discussion It's going to have to be as to whether or not you fix it at all? whether or not there are funds to even fix it. That's correct. Just in the situation of the, of the air handler over the pool, we, we keep burning up motors in there um, because the, the, the system is in such age state yeah. that it's actually pulling in some of the fibrous material into the motor and it'll burn it out. But we can change out bearings and motors for five to $15,000 a, a time. And we've went through a few here in the last couple of years. Um, when it gets to a point we can't change that motor out anymore, then we're going to have to look at the complete system replacement. So we're just trying to limp along and get as far down the road with it as we can because, yeah, I think it actually, I know one estimate we had on the air handling system was probably closer to 300000 And when you get to that type of replacement of any system in that pool, um, you have to say, is it, is it worth it or do we end up having to shut it down? Uh, same thing, we, we have some minor cracks in the pool basin. Um, if those get worse, does that cause us, because that would be sure. yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or more to replace that or repair it in some way. I'm not even sure how we would do that. but So, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Those are the decisions we would have to get to. So it's not something you can necessarily plan and budget for, but we just kind of know what's out there. I only ask one more question about the pool, but those air handlers, those don't just affect, the, the, well, maybe the one that's going down more often does, but that doesn't just affect the square footage that's above or in or the volume of of, of um, the, the cubic volume that's in the pool room that's affecting areas outside like above the uh, locker rooms and, and other attached uh, spaces correct yeah there there are times we've had to shut it down for, and you you notice it throughout the center part of the building um, yeah. you get corrosiveness in the locker rooms those types of things. so the reason why I'm asking that is I, I I think it makes perfect sense to not have that on here because it's not a planned expenditure that we're gonna make but I and maybe the answer is well we'll have to maybe you get this this bad of a situation but we're not just protecting the pool area you're also protecting those other surrounding areas uh, you know and and so is there with knowing that that's going to probably happen again is it smart to budget at least something for those uh, motor replacements or uh, repairs or do you get to a spot where you know that goes out the second or third time and now we've spent so much money where the board just says look drain the dang thing and then you don't have that air quality issue with the locker rooms and everything that's around it just asking it's at the board's discretion we if if you would like us to include it in the capital projects plan absolutely we can uh within the the operations budget itself um you, you know within that 34 percent that covers sort of just it's so broad just other capital work that's yeah. that's the area i would think of us doing at least those five thousand ten thousand dollar repairs the two hundred thousand dollar decision or three hundred thousand dollar decision, if it ever comes up, I, I, I agree with with Matt where I think you are, which is that that's going to require probably a large conversation. Okay, because when we look at that thirty five percent of the operations fund, I mean you're you're looking at you know over two million dollars, and when you look at just these these projects, to your point. And it's over 800,000 just there in these projects. Right. So we, you're right, we can't at all do these. These are just estimates. And in a way, and to keep taxes down and to keep the budget under control, we've listed these. And for budgeting purposes, we're asking for that uh, operations budget amount. And we'll, uh, we'll triage things as we, as we go. Right. I mean, I, I think that it's going to be prudent for us to take on at least some capital work. And, and I think the community would probably respect and and be okay with that, uh, but but yeah, I agree with you too that we're, we're not going to be able to take on all of these. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's all. Um, 
On your the boilers, going back to those, it, you may not have the figures there in front of you, but how much do you suspect uh, we have into repairing those boilers now already? Yeah, we I, actually in talking with Richard, and I know he's met with twice with uh, the representatives. We actually have that figure, but it's escaping me right now. It's it's tens of thousands of dollars. But I, I, I can't recall exactly what that number is. One thing, one thing that I could share that maybe would be useful, at least on the south boiler, is um, the estimated cost for repair that we received, the, the quote we received was, um, was over $10,000 for, for repair of that particular boiler. And you know, a, a threshold that, that Dr. Schaefer and I speak about you know, with some regularity is when we start to get to a third or a half of the cost of replacement of, of anything, of, of anything that's capital in nature, and we're, we're talking about putting repairs into that on the next repair. That, that's probably a point where it's, it's logical to pause and, and figure out, are, are we throwing money after something that's, you know, we're going to have to spend on again in the near future? And it's always a hard decision. Sure. In, this, in this particular case, we, we gave that company an ultimatum. After, after meeting with them once, we gave them an ultimatum to come and correct it, make it right at their cost, and they refused to do it. So we're left with pretty much trying to limp through something we know is going to fail, uh, or replace it, and we know we've we've got. I think we are already at about a third of the cost of that boiler uh, yeah. in repairs, and, um, and we just feel like it's going to be best and most efficient, cost-wise, to go ahead and replace the the one at, at South. Yeah, I and, and I agree with that, and, and that's kind of where I was going with that was that it, it gets to a certain point when you know that that particular company's product. Is junk and you're going to have problems with it. You're almost money ahead by going ahead and replacing all of them. And I know it's expensive and we're tight on money, but you're money ahead by just replacing it and getting something reliable in that you're not having to put, you know, penny after penny after penny in. Um, and in the long run, you may be saving money that way. And you may, I don't know if efficiency is a rating of a boiler or not, uh, but you might be able to get something that's more efficient to, to actually add to your cost savings on that. I think so. What's ironic is right next to that boiler is another boiler by the same company that's actually older. It's an older model. It, it works great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question I had on the wireless access point refresh, are there any grants that we can apply for that? Uh, there, well, one thing about those are E-rate eligible, correct, Mr. Rader? Yeah, I'm getting a nod that, that they are. It's E-rate eligible, so I, I, there may become grants that we could apply for that that's entirely possible. The E-rate was what you were talking about, getting half our money back, but right? we'll get half our yeah. money back on I was on, just on wondering if there was any other grants that we could apply to get the other half back or recoup uh, any of the other cost. Uh, too early to tell right now, but we'll certainly keep our eyes open. I know we've, we've landed a couple of large grants this year, which are very helpful, so yeah. is that opportunity? Opportunity comes, we'll certainly take advantage of it. Okay. And then on the maintenance vehicles, are those a one-time cost? I mean, are, do we purchase those as? Yes. Okay. And we've gotten <laughs> many, many years and many, many miles out of those. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just one other question for me on the the one that has all the other projects. Are the, are those listed in like an order of priority or? Uh, <laughs> they all have the same date with the exception of the last one. Um, no, that, that's a good question. It, it's relatively arbitrary, actually. Okay. Uh, the, the first, I mean, seal coating, I, you know, we've paved those lots. It, it makes sense, in, in my opinion at least, to, you know, preserve them for the long term. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but then the wireless access point down at the bottom, that's, that's a very high priority. I mean, we'll, we'll definitely take that on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's one. It's actually, if we're putting on priority, it would be very near the top because particularly with the wireless needs that we have, uh, you know, walked into very quickly in the last six months, and and our system has has functioned great. And uh, uh, Mr. Rayner and our tech department are to be credited for that. We we have to stay ahead of that curve of replacement of equipment, so that one's going to be a high priority. If I remember when uh, the seal coating was done before, that saved on some of our workman's comp claims, did it not? It did. It, well, and just... Uh, and then it caught... It, it yeah, our, our parking our lots were in, 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 were in not, not great shape 
about five, six years ago. Yeah. We've, we've got them up to um, a standard, and we, we're, these are to maintain them at that standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was a important. Uh, it definitely was. Okay, let's move. Uh, are there any other questions uh, from the board regarding the capital projects presentation? All right, moving to bus replacement. Okay. Uh, we'll go through bus, bus replacement quickly. Uh, bus replacement, I'll go back to the PowerPoint slide just briefly. Sure. Bus replacement, um, the concept of the plan is similar to the capital projects plan. It covers five years instead of three. Um, through, through state law, the, the assumed useful life for a school bus is 12 years. Um, we've, we've gotten more out of our buses, uh, you know, typically at least. We, we've probably, you know, while we pass inspection and, and they're doing fine, we, we're maybe a little bit further past that than we'd like to be in some cases. But, but the default by, by at least state statute is a 12-year assumed useful life. Uh, and this covers expenditures from the, the operations fund. So we'll go over and look at the bus replacement plan. The first page is the resolution that we'll ask the board to adopt at the October 5th school board meeting. The second page is the list of school buses. Uh, this one is prioritized in the sequence in which we would anticipate replacing them. Uh, and this is based upon uh, Mrs. Parsons' judgment. It's gonna generally follow that the oldest bus gets replaced first, but, but you know, she knows best. She, she and her mechanics know best which, which buses uh, you know, ha have reached the point where it's time to retire them. Uh, w what I'll tell you is that we have budgeted, or, or for the, the bus replacement plan, we have assumed uh, three school buses per year that we're going to pay for out of operations. Um, and what I'll, what I'll tell you in terms of the budget that we covered earlier is we, we budgeted for four school buses in, in the budget that I put together. Again, keep in mind that we're going to spend less than what we actually put in the budget. Um, in actuality, uh, and, and we can cover this, you know, anytime you'd like. This, this doesn't have to necessarily be in the scope of this meeting. In actuality, I would anticipate that we'll probably pay for one school bus in 2021 out of the operations fund and pay for one or two school buses or maybe three um, using some um, general obligation proceeds um, that we, we have on hand. Uh, we, you know, that's, again, that's a long-term conversation in terms of the direction that we'd like to go for how to fund bus purchases. We've put three per year on here, and I think realistically we'll probably spend less than that out of the operations fund on school buses. There are two additional, I'm sorry, there, there are two additional pages to the bus replacement plan just on the state template. Neither of them apply to us. They deal with, with folks that contract for, for bus services, and we're not in that boat. And just for clarification, every year we have to submit our updated bus plan for a five-year period of time, correct? Correct. And this, and if I recall, this really is no different um, very much uh, from the bus replacement plan that we submitted last year. Also, also correct. We, we have replaced several school buses since last year, so those yeah, of would course. be off the list, but yep. otherwise very similar. All right, very good. Uh, questions about the bus replacement plan? Okay, obviously those dis, uh, decisions will be made on an individual basis for the expenditures later, but for the plan, I have no questions. Dr. Beatty, any questions on that? No. Nope. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's, is that, uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Parkinson or Dr. Schaefer? I no, don't. No, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so this is for information purposes and for a hearing. So we have two uh, members of the public here. Um, if you would like to speak um, uh, based on what you've heard at this time, please come forward to the microphone and uh, state your name and address and um, share your thoughts. Thank you. Dave Potter, 1947 Knightsbridge Road. First of all, Matt, would the slides you went through tonight be available to the public? The last time I looked at your website, they weren't out there. I haven't looked at them in a couple of days, so it would yep. be helpful. We will make them available. No, no real question about the budget per se, other than what's the process for building it in terms of does the head of maintenance participate, uh, transportation, et cetera, just what's the process? And then how is it laid out for monitoring during the year in terms of tracking what you're doing compared to the budget? So no question on the numbers per se, but just kind of what's your budgeting process to build it and to monitor it? 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, look, why don't you go ahead and answer that? I think it's a good question for the, uh, for the public. Yeah. So uh, in terms of formulating the budget, the, the starting point for us is, is really um, our historic expenditures. Uh, we go, we, I went back to, to 2019, which was the last full year that we completed. Um, that was kind of where we started is, is um, we identified the money that we spent all across the board. I mean, we're talking elementary and middle school and high school salaries all the way through you know, what we spent on fuel for the school buses and so forth. Uh, for things that are, you know, we've got raises and we know how much our raises were last year and we have a rough idea of where we might be heading this year. Uh, we go ahead and build those in uh, proportional to what we spent. We'll make adjustments for, for positions that aren't there any longer. So uh, we have uh, several, several teaching positions that, um, again, through attrition weren't filled last year. And so that's reflected um, in the budget. And then there are um, manual adjustments that are made kind of as needed, and there, there are many of them that, that we factor in compared to uh, historic actual expenditures. So for instance, uh, we have more in, um, we have school bus purchases that I mentioned that are budgeted in. I, I budgeted four in spite of the fact that we spent three and the price for those school buses has gone up. So we'll make manual adjustments like that. Uh, Latchkey used to be handled in its own fund instead of in um, the operations fund. So we make adjustments to um, reflect what we actually expect to spend. Uh, and again, there's, there's those kind of adjustments sort of throughout. In terms of monitoring the budget, uh, so we, we close out the books um, each month. We have, we have a treasurer, a corporation treasurer, who um, is really my right hand for this. She, she closes out the books each month. We track actual expenditures relative to, to budgeted expenditures. Um, at, the, at the highest level, we're looking at it at the fund level. I mean, the, the fund level is, is um, sort of the most important area, but we are keeping track, too, on um, some of the known anticipated expenditures that we had. Um, some that are tough to predict and that we will budget a little bit high for are those capital expenditures. And we, we do that with an expectation that we're going to end up spending less, uh, but we keep a close eye on those. Um, each month, we... Um, we take a look at where we stand relative to appropriations on the overall fund level for the education and the operations funds. Um, quarterly, we do the same, and we report it to, to the school board. Um, and that's, that's broken down at more of an appropriation level. Um, and, and we invite their, their feedback. But um, probably the most important thing that, that we're doing is keeping an eye on the cash balance throughout the year. Uh, we, have, we have a goal to, to not see our cash balance drop or at least only let it drop in a targeted and a controlled way um, across our funds, and, and we're managing that this year. Uh, but we certainly have obstacles, um, obstacles ahead of us. Um, again, the, the biggest one, and one that we just don't talk about that often, is that, that increment revenue that, that was um, a factor in our budget over a period of years and was used to, fact, to pay for capital expenses is, is unfortunately just not there um, that that does some things in terms of freeing up some room in in the debt service fund or in construction but it, but it takes away our operations expenditures so um, it's it's an active monitoring process I think uh, to uh, a, a point was asked is, is an accurate one uh, just getting input from your from your directors uh, the building principals uh, walking those buildings in the spring and summer uh, getting input on um, projected uh, budgetary needs at the buildings, including some uh, capital needs that, that factor into that three-year plan. I know Mr. Parkinson uh, conducts that, and he's also meeting formally with those directors each month at least once, if not more than once. And so basically, I mean, you got a historical and a revenue-based approach, and the neat thing that we have is our business model doesn't change very much compared to, um, you know, private business right so we can to a greater extent have an educational make an educational guess or an educated guess as to rev, what revenues will be especially to the extent that we can actually affect the tax rate um, and so you can uh, I think measure a lot, lot better that way than then from a historical standpoint not a whole lot changes yeah we have uh, some change but it's it's a small percentage versus us creating an entirely new product and launching a product and not knowing what those costs and revenues will be. So yep. both, what you're saying is both, both um, approaches you take. Right. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Thoughts? Is that good? Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay.
Uh, not hearing any other uh, questions, I'm going to take a motion to um, adjourn. So moved. We have a motion to adjourn. We have a second. Second. <laughs> Dr. Beatty, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We're adjourned. Thank you. All right.